Hello, this is Jeremy Zimmerman, and today we're going to talk about point defects. The reason we need to talk about defects is that crystals are never perfect. By definition, they are always finite in size, and so they, at the very least, include a surface, which is a type of defect. These defects tend to um, govern properties of our materials in most cases as well. There's actually this wonderful quote by Colin Humphreys, it's, crystals are like people. It's the defects in them which tend to make them interesting. And this is very true. So first, I want to categorize defects. And we typically categorize them based on the dimensionality of the defect. So we have point defects, which are zero-dimensional, line defects, planar defects, and finally the three-dimensional volume defects. So defects drastically change many of the properties of materials. So I just want to give a few examples of this. Um, first would be... Um, excited state lifetimes in semiconductors. So if you want to make a good solar cell, you need to have a really long ex, um, excited state lifetime. You, you want those excited states to stick around for as long as possible. And so the way you do this is you get rid of as many defects as possible. And when you buy a solar grade silicon wafer from a company, that company has gone to extraordinary efforts to eliminate as many defects as possible. But that wafer's useless for a solar cell when you buy it, you have to then process it into a device. And when you process that into a device, you add defects into the semiconductor to modify its conductivity. You might make parts of it uh, n-type, parts of it p-type. And then you'll probably go to additional efforts to passivate other defects like the surfaces. Another example is ionic conductivity in ceramics. This shows up in things like fuel cells and then the oxygen sensor in your car. A fun one is the color of gemstones. So if you take aluminum oxide, this is often called corundum when it is in its pure, clean state, and this is a clear um, crystal. If you add a little bit of chromium to that, you get a you can get a deep red color, which is ruby. And if you add a little bit of titanium and iron to this, you can get a deep blue color, which is sapphire. You're also going to worry a lot about defects in your kinetics class in the future because uh, the diffusion is of of material within in another material is very much governed by the defects that are present. Finally, if you're interested in mechanical properties of materials, many of those properties are directly determined by the defects that are present. And these are very much about things like grain boundaries and dislocations. So I want to talk about defects in a single component material first. And we'll first talk about what we call, what we call intrinsic defects. So the, one of the first things we could do, first types of defects we could create, is we could remove an atom. So I'm just going to do that on the upper left here. And so this is what we call a vacancy. And that just means you have a missing atom. We can also put an extra atom somewhere into the into a interstitial site in the lattice. Um, this will have to distort the lattice around it to make room for it, and which is what I've shown uh, right here on this. This extra atom has been inserted and the lattice around it had to squeeze together to accommodate it. We also have extrinsic defects, and the classic example of that is a substitutional impurity. So that's what I'm showing here. We've removed one blue atom, and we put a green atom in its place. We can also have an impurity sit on an interstitial site. So I've shown that here in red. Um, one of the interesting things is that we usually can't fit any atom into most interstitial sites without distorting the lattice. So this red atom is a little too big for that interstitial site, so it's going to distort the atoms around it just a little bit. So we need to talk kind of about how defects are created and what we need to worry about when we're creating our pictures of them. First thing is we have to worry about mass balance. Um, that is, mass is always conserved, and so we have to pay attention to this when we're writing equations down and figuring out what's happening. Um, so conserve mass. Uh, the next thing is electroneutrality. Um, that is, charges can't be created or destroyed. So if a defect pulls extra, extra electrons in or gives up electrons, those have to go someplace else into the crystal, and we have to pay attention to where they are. 
Um, fi finally, we have to preserve the site ratio. So if we have, let's just say, a ceramic with anions and cations present, we have to keep the site ratio constant when we take defects out. We can't we just we have to pay attention and, and make sure we're we're keeping track of that. Otherwise, we will um, end up making mistakes. So I want now want to talk about point defects in multi-component materials. So again, we're going to remember to conserve mass, um, electron neutrality, and site ratios. So the first one we want to talk about is an anti-site defect pair. Um, an anti-site is simply an anion, an anion on a cation site or a cation on an anion site. Um, so I'm going to show this here. So we've taken an anion and a cation and we've flipped them into the opposite locations. And I've done this as a pair to make sure that we have followed all of our rules that we have to follow. The second type of defect that I wanna talk about is a shot key defect. And a shot key defect is um, a stoichiometric group of, def of vacancies. So you might notice that the crystal I'm starting out with here is a little bit smaller than I started out with before, um, and that was intentional. Um, and what we're going to do is this, this crystal has a one-to-one -one ratio of anions and cations. And so um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove an ion, anion from the center of the crystal, and we're going to move it out to the edge of the crystal in that empty space that I had created. And so we have a vacancy here, and we, and then we're going to do the same thing with a cation, and we're going to move that one on out to the outside of the crystal as well. So now we have two vacancies, um, which is a stoichiometric number of vacancies for this particular crystal. Now, if the crystal had a different anion to cation ratio, like a two to three ratio, you'd have to create you know, two cation and three anion vacancies to create a full shot key defect. And the last type of defect I want to talk about is a Frenkel defect. Um, and this, a Frenkel defect is um, the combination of a vacancy and an interstitial. Um, so I'm going to show that here. And so we've taken this atom and we've moved it from this site over to here. Um, and so these are, in a lot of materials, these are really hard to form, but they do um, show up in some kind of interesting situations. One of them is when you have uh, radiation damage. If you send really high energy particles into your, into your crystal, it may literally knock an atom out of place and it will stop someplace um, after it's given off enough of its kinetic energy. Now that we have described the basic types of point defects, I want to talk about the notation for point defects. We use something called kroger vink notation. Now, kroger vink notation will look something like this. We're going to have an X with a subscript and a Y script of a Y and a Z. The X is the defect species. So if you have an impurity, this will be the elemental symbol of that impurity. Um, it may also be a V for a vacancy. Um, the one caveat to that is, you know, almost all people use a capital V for the vacancy, but a few people work with vanadium, so they have to use a lowercase v. The, the subscript is the type of site that the defect is sitting on. So again, this will be typically an elemental symbol. Again, look at the material that is the crystal that you are putting a defect into. Um, the other option is you could have the defect sit on an interstitial site, so that'll get an I. Finally, we're going to describe the charge of that site relative to the normal ion charge that sits on that lattice site. So if the site is more positive than the original site in the perfect crystal, it gets a black dot. If the site is, the defect is more negative than the pure crystal, then it will get a prime symbol. And finally, if it is the same charge as in the crystal, it's going to get an X, indicating it is neutral. So let's do a couple examples. First one we'll do are vacancies in potassium chloride. So I'm going to put a vacancy on a potassium site. 
so that potassium cation is usually a plus one charge. The vacancy will have zero charge associated with it, so it is you know, one less than normal, so it gets the prime symbol. We could also describe the vacancy on a chlorine site. So again, the anion is usually you know, negatively one charged, but the vacancy is uncharged, so we're one more positive than normal. Next, I want to put an oxygen anion on an interstitial site in uranium dioxide. So I'm going to put oxygen on an interstitial. Again, this is a two minus on a normally uncharged site, so we get two primes. Finally, we're going to put a sulfur anion on an oxygen anion site in uranium dioxide. Now, these have the same charge, so it's just going to be sulfur on oxygen with an X for being uncharged. In order to understand the formation of defects, we often write them as equations, just like we did uh, chemical equations in general chemistry. So first of all, I'd like to talk about stoichiometric reactions. First stoichiometric reaction I'd like to talk about is a Schottky defect in aluminum oxide. So we're going to write this down as shown on the right. We're going to write nothing on the left side of the equation. Um, there's an equivalency symbol going back and forth between that and two vacancies on aluminum sites and three vacancies on oxygen sites. Um, I've written down above the equivalency that we're working in a aluminum oxide, just which helps us keep track of what's happening um, to our material. So we need to go through and understand, um, make sure we've covered all of our bases here. So first we have to make sure that we've conserved mass. So we have no mass on the left and we have no mass on the right. These vacancies have no mass. Um, we need to check our charges. So we have uh, on the left, there's, there's no charge. And so on the right, better add up to no charge as well. So we have two aluminum vacancies and each of those have a charge that's three units more negative than uh, the lattice should be, that lattice site should be. And then the oxygens, we have three of those, and they're each two units more positive than that site should be. So we have six negatives and six positives, so our charges add up to zero. Finally, we need to make sure that we're maintaining our site ratios. So we have two aluminums and three oxygen sites, and so we've maintained stoichiometry. So now I want to do a Frenkel defect in silver bromide. Silver bromide is one of the, th these materials like this are one of the classes of materials where Frenkels are actually relatively low in defect energy. So I'm going to write this down. Um, we're going to take a silver on a silver site, um, which is neutrally charged relative to the parent lattice. And we're going to move that silver from that silver site onto an interstitial site leaving behind a vacancy. So again, silver on silver on the left, we're working in silver bromide. And then we're going to create a silver on an interstitial site, which on the silver has a plus one charge, so that's going to get one black dot. And the vacancy on the silver site is one more negative than it was than the site was before. So we have a negative sign. So now we have to go through and make sure that we have uh, maintained all of the requirements. So first we look at mass. There's one silver atom on the left and one silver on the right. We need to look at charge. The left is charge free. And then on the right, we have one positive and one negative charge. So that balances. And finally, we need to look at site ratios. So um, we actually, we haven't created any vacancies um, aside from where we took that silver from. So we haven't changed the site ratio in this case at all. Uh, the next one I want to do is an impurity addition. And so we're going to add calcium chloride into potassium, into a potassium chloride crystal. So I'm going to write this reaction down as a calcium chloride is going into, is going to create one calcium on a potassium site. And that calcium has a plus two charge and the, the Potassium only had a, a plus one, so we get a single black dot on there. And then we put two chlorine on chlorine sites, so those are neutral relative to the parent lattice. And um, we have to, so if we look at this, what we see is that we have mass balance on the left and right. We have two calciums, or one calcium on the left, one calcium on the right. Uh, 
two chlorines on the left, two chlorines on the right. And we can look at, um, but if we look at our site balance, something's amiss here. So I actually wrote this down with two potassium chlorides um, above our equivalency sign here. So um, this is to help remind us um, what we're doing. We took two chlorine ions and put them onto chlorine sites. So that requires that we have two potassium chloride units, but we only added one calcium to a potassium site. So that means we also need to have a vacancy on a potassium site. So now if we look at our charge balance, we have nothing on the left, and then we have a single plus on the, the calcium on potassium um, uh, impurity, and then we have two neutrals, and then we have a negatively, a relatively negatively charged vacancy on a potassium. So that all adds up to zero on both sides. We could have done this reaction a different way. And the other way we could have done this is we could have taken the calcium and we could have put it on an interstitial site instead of on a potassium site. So we have a doubly charged calcium interstitial, two chlorines on chlorines, and in order to um, balance our site ratio, we need to have two vacancies on potassium sites. So if I go through and look at this, we've balanced our charge. We have um, plus two here, and we have two minus ones here, so that balances. We already worried about our site ratio, and um, mass was conserved. That's how we started out the, the problem. So next, I'm going to look at non-stoichiometric reactions. So these are a little bit more complicated, and we're only going to go through one example here. Um, so what can happen is a species can leave the crystal. So let's just say we're looking at magnesium oxide. Um, we can take an oxygen on an oxygen site and we can convert that to oxygen gas and that can leave the system. Um, when we do this, the, we're taking a ion and we're converting it into a, a gas. And so um, this oxygen two minus uh, uh, cation, or anion, sorry, the oxygen two minus anion um, has to give up those electrons uh, and when it forms into the gas. And so the way we're going to draw the, uh, write this out is we're going to say an oxygen on an oxygen site is going to give us a half of a oxygen two gas molecule, a vacancy on an oxygen site, and two extra electrons. Um, so in some cases, these electrons may be free to move around in the lattice, um, but what tends to happen in a lot of these kind of wider gap materials is those electrons are recaptured by the vacancy. So, um, and, and that maintains kind of the local charge neutrality. And so we can rewrite this equation as an oxygen on an oxygen site is converted into half of an oxygen gas molecule and then a neutral vacancy. And that vacancy is neutral because it is holding on to two electrons. And this is kind of a, another neat example um, when you, these show up a lot in, in crystals that would otherwise be clear and the amount of energy it takes to remove those electrons from that vacancy is on the order of a couple volts, uh, electron volts. So this means that um, it, it can absorb optical wavelengths. So um, this is often called a color center in, in materials. And so this gives some gems their color. Now I have a few things I'd like you to think about. First, what type of materials might have a low energy of formation for anti-site defects? Second, I'd like you to think about um, how the atoms surrounding a vacancy respond to the creation of that vacancy. Do they contract towards the vacancy or do they move away from it? I want you to do this both for a metal and for a ionic material. And finally, I want you to practice the kroger vink reaction equations by dissolving potassium chloride into magnesium fluoride. So we have to put some boundary conditions, so I want you to assume that um, you only form substitutional defects and then any vacancies that are necessary to balance the equation. So first think about what are the most likely defects and then write out the equation. Thanks, I'll see you in class.